it's not quite island time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just uh, they helped me yes, this helped morning. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good help. Everybody, uh, first of all, uh, special thanks to our generous sponsors, Long Live the Kings oh. and mm -hmm. Western Prince Whale Watching and Wildlife Tours, Friday Harbor Rental, and then that wonderful couple who uh, anonymously donated socks. One hundred and fifty pairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to start with uh, the poem that really speaks to this exhibition and is written by Gu, and I hope I do it justice. <laughs> you and I, you are born in a small stream, you grow up in the river, and you gather strength in the ocean. When you return, you become red and give birth to your children. Finally, you lie down on the bottom of the stream, waiting until next spring comes. You watch as those red eggs turn into baby salmon. A smile appears on your face, the current that takes your newborn salmon to the river and then the ocean. I see you in the small stream. I see you in the river. I see you in the ocean. I see you everywhere. I follow you, I become you. Um, I met uh, Gu, I believe, uh, hmm. 16 years ago in uh, Vancouver, BC on a art scouting mission. And um, as an immigrant myself, I was captivated, captivated with his work uh, dealing with uh, living in two cultures. Uh, Gu Zhang is a multimedia artist from China, now lives in Vancouver, BC, and he works in painting, drawing, printmaking, sculpture, photography, video, <laughs> digital imagery, text, performance art, and installation, which he has brought to Friday Harbor. He has exhibited nationally and internationally, including in more than 40 countries uh, with uh, solo exhibitions all over the world. Uh, there are two public arts projects of his here in uh, Washington State. One is a mural uh, at Safeco Field, and one is uh, in the uh, Seattle Public Library at the Columbia Branch. Um, his work has been reviewed by Art in America, The New York Times, Flash Art, and many other art publications. He's also an author and uh, writes, uh, you know, for various uh, art magazines. Um, the History Channel uh, has also uh, uh, created a documentary uh, in 2001 the Yellow Pear, the story of Gu Zhang. And uh, that was in March 2001. And then his daughter subsequently uh, became a filmmaker and now lives in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and has created um, a short documentary, uh, which you will see tonight. Um, a River of Migration examines the life cycle of the salmon in two environments, uh, fresh water, <coughs> salt water, uh, having to adapt, and um, uh, that's what immigrants have to do. So there is a metaphor to Goose life and uh, the life of all the migrants uh, in this uh, world today. So without further ado, I would like to ask you to welcome Gu Zhang. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. So first, uh, I would like to thank to the San Juan Islands Museum of Art, the whole committee, and uh, Barbara, Peter, Hannah, and many, uh, how to say, volunteers and donors towards to my installation, A River of Migration, be showing here on Friday evening. 
So those days, I came here at uh, uh, on Saturday afternoon. We start to install the, the, my installation until today we finish most of them. So maybe after the lecture, if you pass by the gallery, you will see those salmon fish is in the gallery glass area. You will see it. Okay, so here I will give a short uh, talk around the 40 or 45 minutes. So the theme will be on the migration. I, s I came from China 27 years ago, you know, uh, after Tiananmen Square massacre 1989. Then until now it's 27 years, you know, I am a Canadian, all Canadian Chinese here. So where I came from, if you see the, the map here, you will see this is the Yangtze River, you know, from the Tibet, Qinghai Tibet Mountain flow through the Shanghai into the Pacific. But across the Pacific, whatever, I landed here in Vancouver and live by the Fraser River. So here, I like to make that space link those two rivers cross the Pacific Ocean. In a reality, this is impossible. But in a personal migration journey, it is possible to link those two different geographical space and through the cultural practice to make a new identity in North American hair. So you, you, you will see what I have done is to move the Yangtze River, then link to the Fraser River here. So that's a very, you know, a journey, a line of journey. <clears throat> so to link to the Chinese history in Canada by the Fraser River, there is a real way the Chinese uh, uh, migrant workers came to Canada to build up the railway, you know, <clears throat> but to also to build up the Chinese community here. This is uh, the Barkville in North BC. Now it's become a historical place. You know, you can go there to visit during the summertime. This was the Chinese uh, Chinatown at a time around the 1860s, there were over 6,000 Chinese workers live and work there. So th those are living conditions. They also brought their wooden boxes, objects from China to Canada because the dream one day when they make enough money, they can go back to China. But that dream wasn't become true. Like this person, he came to North BC when he was 14 years old. Until he was reached to 60, he couldn't have enough money to go back to China. He decided to walk back to China from Barkville. But after he walked from Barkville to Fraser River nearby, he spent three days. Then he finally realized he couldn't go home anymore. Then he returned to Buckville for the rest of his life. So that was the concept of home. No matter where you are, you have to return to your hometown, be buried there. But that was the old gen generation Chinese migrant stories like this one in Victoria. If you went to Victoria, this place is called Hearts Point, you know, they're buried over around 900 Chinese uh, immigrants' bones there. Then their, you know, tombstones is faced to the Pacific, face to China, dream to return to their home. So this is, gave me the idea. I made a show, a, an installation in China last December called Bone house. Because uh, at that place, since uh, the beginning of 19, uh, uh, the end of uh, 19th century, they start to have a bone house there. T 
to wash the people's bone. That means those Chinese migrants died and buried in Canada. Then after seven years, they, they have to dig down, dig out their bones, then be sent to Victoria here at the hot point, then be washed, and also to be banded, then put back into a, a, a wooden box, then to send ship back to Canton, China, which is South China, to be buried there. So then I recreated those black and white photographs you know, to imagine the process. That process is all about going home. No matter you are alive or you die, you must go home. So that, that kind of um, concept of home to comparison with today is totally different to my generation. <clears throat> this was at um, Moon Night, you know, full moon night. I was there last year to document this uh, cemetery. So you see this one individual a tombstone face to the Pacific to dream to go back. Oops, why am I? Oh, this is, okay. But for me, <clears throat> I came here as I talk about after Tiananmen Massacre in 1989. So this was whatever I experienced in the city of Beijing. The people used their own bicycles to make a barricade on the street to try to stop army tanks to go into Tiananmen Square. But I also did a large drawings, huge large drawings. But you will see the tank just zoom over the bicycles. Right, so at that moment, I feel each bicycle is like one person. Many bicycles together, there is a unit. The tank can go over bicycles, but people's inner power cannot be conquered. So that's why when I came to Canada in September 1989, I start to create a series of artwork about that moment. This is whatever my dream for China was crushed by tanks. But to break through those enclosures, to come to Canada, I also face another reality. My dream for freedom and democracy also was crushed by the reality of not speaking the language, the English. <laughs> so I was placed at the bottom of the society. Uh, <clears throat> but to stand up, I have to start work. I, my first time was a busboy at UBC cafeteria. You know? So that cafeteria opened the door to accept me to walk into this society. So every day I walk with those garbage, every day I sue away those garbage bags. But I feel I cleaned my inner self a little bit each day. I become a better person each day. So that when I look at people who crush those beer cans, Coca-Cola cans, I got my inspiration. I was under the crushing between those two cultures. But if you know Andy Warhol's soup can, his soup can is talk about everybody alike, everybody, there is no knife, just like a mass production. But for my crushed can, which is from no life become knife, because you never find two crushed can has same shape, you know, which is impossible. So that unique shape inspired me to rebuild up my identity to stand up again in this new society. So at the time, I, I made a, a series of crushed cans, uh, paintings, to express my feelings to go through that crushed uh, the, the time. 
So this was so, uh, an installation, it's called uh, the basement. I, at the right beginning, our family were living in a basement for three years. This basement, which was very deep underground, you know, you, you see the window even though underground. At uh, some rainy day, big rain, the water will be come through a window going to our living rooms. But it was a, an isolated place. I remember one day I asked my, my wife, how do you think about Vancouver? Then she answered me, she said, it is like a basement. <laughs> I was shocked, but I, I, I thought she was right because for us, a new arrival here without a language, without knowing the society and the culture, no matter how beautiful the landscape is, which is not belong to us. The real place where we belong is where we live, which is the basement. But the basement also become a, a metaphor of our cultural transition from one culture to another. We have to put our roots underground profoundly in order to catch the lights later on. So beyond the doors and the windows, I have those red banners and the paintings to talk about our process to go through the cultural shock at that time. I also made a, <clears throat> a installation called the Smile, which I did make three of us family different smile faces, but also did I write a poem to talk about beyond the smile, what kind of process and the suffering we have been through. You know, at the right beginning, we don't speak the language. We try to use our smile to make a com communication with others, but it was always makes mistake because people don't answer why we smile to them. So until we finally learn the language, a real smile appearing on our face. So this was the, at the Vancouver Art Gallery, uh, a, a big installation called Here, There, Everywhere. So I talk about uh, after several years we live in Vancouver, then we finally find out no matter where, where we are, our home is where we have been which is different from the beginning story, whatever I talk about. So here, I also used our family couch, on family couch, I put those working uniforms. I try to talk about, at the time, we don't have the leisure time. Every day, just work, work, work. <laughs> and this, this drawing is a large drawing on the bike wall in the gallery space. I did it to my daughter who stand on the Rocky Mountains where we first landed here in Canada because when she came to Canada, she was six years old. Then she went to French immersion program school and we, we also sent her to Chinese school on Saturday. So she's trilingual. So when she stood on the Rocky Mountains, I found she is a person, a generation really belong to this land. She become our hope, you know. Also on the gallery space, there are drawings, you know, large drawings, small drawings of objects and landscape from British Columbia. Uh, each image has a story, like this one, the Chinese rice cooker is represent the traditional Chinese culture since we came. We have changed a lot, but we love to eat rice every day. You know? But too, by eating rice and drinking milk every day, we try to bring two cultures together. So this also, if you went to Seattle Art Museum, you remember those Chinese uh, you know, sculptures there. When we first time visited the Seattle Art Museum, my daughter stood in, a, you know, in between those sculptures. That also gave me an inspiration. We have to work hard. We have to learn in the new language and the culture to fit in. Then hope one day our work will be in the gallery space. <laughs> but now it's become true. <laughs> 
So this was our first home, an old home. You know, it's over 90 years old. That was the only house we could buy with that price. So I talk about to have a home, how that kind of joy has come from inside of us. So this was the, 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 the Simon Fish, the first the installation I have made in 1998. I talked about that inspiration when I first time uh, uh, went to Interior BC to watch the Simon Fish return to their small streams and to give uh, birth to next generation, then ready to die. That kind of red is very much inspired me. The salmon fish is small fish, but has a very strong strength from that small body to inspire me to do our best in this new country. So that's why I made 150 fishes to hang in through the gallery space, but also on the floor will be 150 you know, white socks to follow salmon fish. You know, the white socks I talk about because that's personal. You know, everyone's socks has very special smell. <laughs> you know, so that make the difference, right? So to form a, a river path to follow salmon fish's direction, to follow them and also to become one of them. But this we're showing in different places, each time will become very different. You know, this also linked with the Chinese art craft there, then the political posters from the Cultural Revolution. But also the most important thing I like to show here is the salmon fish breaks through the red wall, swimming into a new space. That is a very strong strength I, I like to talk about it because when people talk about the cross, cross cultures, they always talk about there will be a bridge between two cultures. You just walk through the bridge, you're automatically knowing another culture. But for me, I found that, that bridge is not there. If you want to know another culture, you have to jump into the water, take a long distance swimming in water to understand another culture. <laughs> So this was another <clears throat> uh, three large drawings called the drowning. That was happening after nine years in Canada when we first time returned to China in 1998. We had a boating accident. My daughter and I were drowning. You, you know, between knife and dice, we were struggling, but we finally survived. So I made those three large drawings to talk about that kind of personal experience, but also talk about uh, how as individual in front of a big flooding, how could you survive? You have to take your own rea re reactions. So this was uh, a drowning faces. So <clears throat> this one is uh, a photo installation I have made in Montreal in 2001 for the Montreal Photo Biennial. So I created 25 Chinese immigrants photo, uh, photographs and from the, that community, then hanging up across the St. Lawrence Street in Chinatown, Montreal. Yeah, to use the traditional celebration style, but to talk about their identities. The title is I am who I am. But that kind of, to have that kind of confidence has to through generations, through the history, then become part of that belief from individual and the community. They talk about real way, laundry job, and raise the family, and build up Chinatown, and uh, build up a church, under a church to have a Chinese school to keep their language, but to pay for the head tax to bring their family members to come but was not allowed to vote only until Chinese people joined the Second World War. After that, in 47, the Canadian government finally allowed Chinese immigrants to vote, which is to become a real Canadian. 
Uh, to talk about this is our home. This guy has five generations in Montreal, two Christians of multiculturalism. <clears throat> but to talk about two born here, to have a mixed blood, but to be no longer silenced, to speak out, to have our voices in the society. But most important thing is to, to have this idea, I am who I am, you know, that is very important. But I also made another installation called I am Canadian in Toronto, a subway station there. I found the subway is uh, moving areas, is really interesting to carry on the migration flow. <coughs> <coughs> so this is my daughter, <coughs> so who speaks three languages, uh, as I talk about. I also made an installation at the, um, uh, how to say, uh, Museum of Anthropology in UBC in Vancouver in 2010. I have created 2,000 plastic boats to put installed on the uh, gravels, you know, because the grave for First Nation people that remains the water. Then to see this kind of migration boats river to move from outside to go through the grass wall to move to the inside of the museum, but also to link the different exhibition spaces by the boat movement from the other gallery, move to the main gallery there, from different directions to coming together to become a river, just like a fish, you know. And finally, to land in front of my painting, you know, called the Becoming Rivers. This is to, to from Canada also to, Go back to China. This boat carry on those crushed cars will ship to Shanghai to be melted, then make new products, then ship back to us. That's a globalization, <laughs> you know. But this is a three gorgeous, three gorgeous dam built up on the Yangtze River in my hometown. But that project also changed that region of China there are two, more than two million people were forced to move to other places. Then many historical spaces were under the water. Like this city moved three times because the water went up and up again. But also to cut off the mountain peaks to make a, a world factory, you know. And to see the water marks above the orange, you know, river 170 meters high. That has totally changed the Yangtze River. And to see this concrete layer, this layer has blocked the Yangtze River. But to see the sharp of the, of the concrete layer, but to carry on the pen of the river and also the pen from the local community, how they went through then that price for the Three Gorges Dam. So this was also my sculpture, uh, bronze sculpture, Seiko and cell phone. I talk about how China was changed from agriculture society into the high technology. But also the cell phone, uh, you know, means the free information be shared with people. They cannot control anymore. This was so to talk about the culture difference. This is the, uh, uh, you know, replicas of mountain much more in China, <laughs> and Volkswagen on the bottom. <clears throat> <laughs> and the Statue of Liberty replaced in a small pond. <laughs> and Mao and Audrey finally meet in a funeral supply stores. <laughs> and the Kodak were in Forbidden City because the Kodak is yellow and red is totally match the, the imperial Colors and the Starbucks were in, in Forbidden City a few years ago. But I, I saw their menu. They have some one special coffee. We never have it here called the Kung Fu Coffee Series. <laughs> but uh, Michael, this panda named Microsoft. 
you know, because of Microsoft they donate money for the Penta Research Center. But since this Penta is not, not high paid there. <laughs> and also <clears throat> to talk about the between the countryside and the city, you know, through this photograph I, I took a family from countryside move into a city, try to find a place to stay, try to find a job to survive. And to this one called the Undergo. Those two truck drivers were under the big truck, you know, carrying on a small pickup. Because that day was very hot, 45 degrees, they couldn't drive. So they were under, under this uh, of the truck. But for me, I suddenly saw this vision, I found that was meaningful because what change China have made tremendously, but who carried on those changes, which are those ordinary people. And to see this was either fairy people behind the bars, you know. And to talk about the next generation with that uh, Coca-Cola advertisement there, they said, uh, enjoy it, depend on yourself for the new generation in China. But also, uh, I want to say the time, Barbara, can you check the time for me? This is my, my new exhibition, 2014, I made one at the uh, North Vancouver Golden Smith Gallery uh, called Exposed Journey. Yeah, this will be also accompanying the several of my body of work to come together. On the floor, I will talk about those are uh, Apex River, a, a waterfall of Coca-Cola cans. Yeah. <clears throat> Over 35,000, uh, 3,500 of crushed Coca-Cola cans donated by the recycle company there. <laughs> and also the water, water containers here to link to the water drinking system. Two years ago, in Shanghai, in the Huangpu River, they, they found uh, over 16,000 uh, dead body of pigs in the water. So they, they, then the first people complained to the government. They, then the government said, oh, the water is fine, don't worry. But that 16,000 of pigs there, nobody believed that. Then the finally, they have some protest. And finally, the government found the people to took over those the dead body of the pigs away to killing the drinking water system. So I was inspired by that Leo and made this installation there. You know, I used the 250 uh, uh, containers, drinking water drinking container, containers. In each container, there are two or three clay little pigs, dead pigs inside looks like uh, archive drawers there, you see. So on the floor will be 10,000 uh, filed clay pegs, pegs, little pegs. You know, I went to school, 30 schools, made uh, lots of workshops, and a thousand students participate with me to make those tiny pegs there. So it become a big river. I talk about China, you know, to be middle forward of Chinese communities, we should we be a pig, be fated, be killed, or be much more alive with our own souls? That's a question. Yeah. So those are details. So this one was I, I was dealing with uh, seasonal migrant, international migrant workers in Canada. You know. Uh, that history, over 50 years history in Canada, right now there are over 300,000 workers work on the Canadian farmland. They are from Mexico, from Jamaica, Guatemala, and uh, many other countries. So I finally made this map of Canada. You know, I, that was, I, I also made this one in China, in Xi'an Art Museum last uh, summer, and also this was made by cherry tomatoes. <laughs> Over maybe 10,000 of cherry uh, tomatoes made because those uh, seasonal migrant works, they work on the blackberry, 
uh, failed, but we, they also work inside of those greenhouse produce those, uh, you know, uh, cherry tomatoes. Because from local market, we saw those cherry tomatoes label made, that's made in Canada or local products. But I say international migrant workers contributions were totally erased by the label. So that's why I, I, I try to speak out, try to make attention to those migrant workers. Yeah, they were handing those uh, cherry tomatoes. But also you will see this tomato is slowly to dry, you know, inside the gallery after two or three months. Yeah, this was at the beginning. And uh, at the end, you see, become many different colors. <laughs> yeah, this was like that. And you see the fresh one, then the dried one. <laughs> so that means through the whole exhibition time, the tomatoes is alive. It's not just uh, an object there. So this one, the last one I show you, I, I just uh, went to Ecuador, this student, to make another installation there. I sh uh, I'm showing you the map. The, I, I think, uh, uh, let's see, the Ecuador will be around here. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so this is the map. So I went there because they invite me to make an art about uh, their plan uh, production at the city of Machana. So then I went there, I saw the, uh, you know, plan uh, fields. Then I finally made a cargo ship called a yellow cargo. The cargo ship made by those plan uh, boxes inside their art center. I used the, uh, over 1,500 banana boxes there. Because banana box is represent local culture, the cargo ship remains the globalization, the link between global and uh, localization. So that's why I decided to make a cargo ship inside there. Then also on each uh, boxes, they also have banana labels, and the video projecting on the bike of the, the ship, which is from the waterfront from the Machala city. You know, you will say usually at the waterfront, a uh, lot poor people live there, but in Machala are uh, working people who live there. So this video, we're showing that. Yeah, so this is uh, from the second floor to look down. Looks like a theater but suddenly have the cargo ship inside, it's unusual. Those from above to look at down there. Yeah. So you, you see the blend labels. You know, I collect uh, many of them there. I found, that because this one, this label also specially shipped to China. Yeah, this is monkey also. And uh, the opening time, when people are around, I found uh, the cargo ship are uh, moving through the people's sea there. Yeah, that's a whole page, that's a whole <laughs> labels I've used for that installation. And uh, I try to use Thomas's words, you can never go home again. And for me, home is, you know, not just the birthplace, is where uh, we have been and feel good to live within. Yeah, go, go, go. I have to keep going. <laughs> That's all. Okay. <laughs> so maybe the film, we, we have to turn off that. So this film made by my daughter uh, on year 2010, which is talk about three of us generation try to speak out, but always be 
hooked down by the authorities in China. What was your bridge to, uh, to contemporary art? It doesn't sound like one of the things that would have been favored during the Cultural Revolution. Yeah, the Cultural Revolution were totally propaganda works uh, people produced at the time. Not I mean, when I was in the countryside. Today, I couldn't show my sketches from the countryside because the time is short. So, but after the Cultural Revolution, people were able to create works based on their thinking from 70 to 89. But after 89 to up to now, it's totally controlled. You only allow certain ways to make art, but the other, maybe very sensitive red lines, you cannot touch. If you touch, you could be in trouble. Yeah, there are so many people were put in jail or disappearing. You know, yeah, that is happening. So that's why I feel I was uncomfortable after 89, June 1st, 1989. So that's why I decided to leave China. So at the time, the Bank Center for the Arts and the Canadian Airline gave me free tickets from China to Bank to, to study. So that's why and how I got out from China. Otherwise, uh, it wasn't impossible. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I also I was lucky. You know, I left China at the end of uh, August in 1989. But uh, start from September 1989, uh, nobody allowed to leave China from universities in China. Wow. Yeah, only one week different. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I was it was difficult. After all, I got my 
visa from Canadian embassies, then I went to Beijing to try to leave China. But when I went to Canadian airline office in Beijing, then they told me because the Canadian government protested the, the student democracy movement, then they stopped the flight from Vancouver to Beijing. Ooh. So I started to come up to then I finally called the, the school, the event center. Then they asked me, wait at the post office where I make a phone call. You wait for 20 minutes, we will fix the problem. Then after 20 minutes, they called me. They said, well, we bought the air tickets from United Airlines from Beijing to Tokyo. So you should go there to fix your ticket. So then I went to United Airlines. I got my tickets. Then I went to the customs. You know, at the time the customer has piles of photographs there. If you are familiar from those photographs, then they will stop you. Mm -hmm. I was lucky, so I was through. <laughs> but when I walked into the airplane, the flight attendant told me, uh, she said, sir, your seat is upstairs. But I sort of was in the economy seat. <laughs> So they bought the first class ticket for me to leave China. So that was very, very emotional. <laughs> yeah. okay. So do you feel safe when you go back to China? Yeah, so this is that why I left China in 89, but I first time I returned to China was 1998, which is after nine years. After we became, I became Canadian citizen. So it was safe. Yeah, at the time it was safe. But now that the 89, when you, we try to follow something related to the history, then they suddenly come to stop us and ask us to leave right away. You know, that morning happened, the afternoon they asked us to leave. You know, that even though ask me to call the Los Angeles Air, uh, Air uh, you know, travel agency to buy the tickets. I said they are in the middle line, nobody work. <laughs> so that's what was happening. You know. yeah. Technology does not make it more difficult to control. <coughs> People's cell phones and computers and mm -hmm. emails and all that makes it. It's totally controlled in China. Email, your website. You cannot visit uh, Google, for example, YouTube, Facebook, Gmail, <laughs> you know, everything is, you cannot do. You can only use the Chinese website, which is nothing true. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a different. A lot of young people, young generation, they know how to go over the internet to get the information from outside of China. Yeah, that's a different. So that's why the technology is great to help people to know the truth, you know, to speak out of their own voices. What kind of arts training did you have before you left China? Oh, I, I was self-taught before I go to university. But, uh, you know, at the time, I was grew up during the Cultural Revolution. The whole university were closing down. No schools, you know. So that's why they send us to the countryside to be a labor, to have real education from the farmers who labor have any education. So only until the Cultural Revolution finally fit in 76. So after that, then the government decided to reopen universities <coughs> and colleges after closing down for 11 years. So after that, as a young people, we could apply to go to school at the time. So at that time, it was difficult to get in. One out of 100 youth could be, you know, go through the hard exam, like national examinations to go to university to study. So that's why I kind of lucky <laughs> to be able to go to university to study for my BFA, undergraduate, and graduate MFA. That finally became an instructor in my school, art school, Sichuan Fine Arts Institute. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, and well uh, I urge all of you to uh, come to the museum and see the exhibition. Uh, 
for those of you who are members and uh, party on Friday night, uh, from 5 to 7. And otherwise, 